Good evening. Thank you all for joining us at the sixth TNQ Inspiring Science Award Ceremony. Let me start by congratulating our finalists. Uh, Iqbal Azmi of Jamia Millia Islamia, Delhi. Mayank Garg of the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi. Pared Nath of the Institute of Life Sciences, Bhuvaneshwar. Suranjana Pal of the, Tia, of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Deep Prakash of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Munalisha Rath of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Rinku Krishnachandra Sahu of the Institute of Life Sciences, Bhuvaneshwar. And Swati Sharma of the Institute, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ISA Pune. These 2022 awards were for the best paper in the life sciences published by a student from India during the period October 1, 2020 to September 30, 2021. Each year applications are invited from young scientists who have registered for a PhD and are within the fourth year of their postdoctoral research. The awards aim to recognize and reward quality science, to inspire scholarship, and to encourage students of science to pursue excellence and do significant and creative work. The conditions are that the submission should be a full length research paper that has been accepted and published. The submitting author must have been affiliated to and the research conducted at a research institution or university based in India. The papers may have co-authors, but the award will only be given to the submitting author. The ISA awards have become increasingly recognized within our institutions of science, and the applications we receive are of impressive scope, spread, and quality. This year, we received 640 entries from over 212 institutions across 119 cities in India. So I have to congratulate you eight. You've really done very well. I would like to thank our 40 member jury, who worked hard in four panels, spending the last two months assessing these entries. They have shortlisted you eight excellent finalists. All the finalists receive an ISA medal, a citation and a MacBook Air. The winner in addition will receive an all expenses paid travel grant to a life science conference of his or her choice anywhere in the world. She or he can, however, opt instead to receive a cash award of rupees two lakhs in place of this travel grant. This will be paid in India. Professor Satyajit Mayer, the director of the National Center of Biological Sciences, NCBS, Bangalore, will preside over the ceremony. Professor Mayer was born in Baroda and received his MSc in chemistry from the IIT Bombay. He was awarded his PhD in the life sciences from the Rockefeller University in New York, where he worked in the laboratory of molecular parasitology. He then worked as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Pathology at Columbia University in New York. In 1996, Satyajit Mayer moved back to India to the National Center of Biological Sciences in Bangalore, which he is now the director. He is also the chairperson of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, a multi-institutional organization set up in 2015, which he helped shape and take forward. Professor Mayer is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of EMBO, the European Molecular Biology Organization. 
He has received the Infosys Prize for Life Sciences, the World Academy of Sciences the Prize, the Twas Prize in Biology, and the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award. May I now invite Professor Satyajit Mayer to give his remarks and have a discussion with each of our finalists on their papers. Professor Satyajit Mayer. Uh, thank you, Mariam, for, for your kind introduction and also for your invitation to chair the sixth edition of the TNQ's Inspiring Science Award. <clears throat> um, before, I, you know, before I invite the finalists, I'd like to say a few words about this award. <clears throat> the institution of this award stems uh, from, I think, the, a larger goal of the TNQ to bring the best in the life sciences to young minds across the country and inspire young researchers in multiple ways. Um, I, I want to point out that there are two flagship efforts uh, from the TNQ, uh, uh, TNQ's program. The first is a uh, annual lecture series, which itself started more than 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and I hope will continue, you know, in person after this pandemic uh, is um, is somewhat abated and will be renewed in vigor. Uh, the the annual uh, lecture itself hosts eminent scientists in five major cities across India, uh, and I should add that many of the scientists who have come for these lectures have also gone on to win many prestigious prizes, including the Nobel Prize. Uh, so they, so I must say, they're chosen with great care, and these lectures are a much-awaited annual event in the life science calendar of this country. The second effort is this uh, award, um, uh, which uh, you know is is meant in some sense to go beyond the five centers of uh, of um, of the where the annual lectures are uh, uh, are being uh, held. Uh, in fact, the Inspiring Science Awards are aimed to inspire young researchers to do both significant and creative work. Uh, and from the entries, as we, as we realize, from 640 entries, eight of you finalists are, are certainly, you know, in some sense, uh, have managed to uh, express your, both your significant creativity and your excellence. I mean, I, I, I must say this, this, it's not an easy task. And having been on the jury for this, it's not an easy task to select these, uh, these uh, um, papers, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, it is about several criteria that we use to think to, to come to this conclusion. Uh, the finalists are selected by an eminent jury made up of senior faculty members from the best life science institutions in the country. And special care is taken to avoid any conflict of interest uh, so that the judges do not mark any paper that they are associated with in any form. Uh, the jury, in fact, consists of four panels of 10 judges each, as uh, Maria mentioned, 40 judges. And each panel is headed by a panel chair. And then there's a second tier, uh, which consists of the panel um, chairs and myself. In this, this year, it was myself and uh, Emily Marcus who uh, participated in the final uh, selection. Uh, and of course, and then we, you know, at the end of the day, have the en unenviable task of selecting one uh, finalist. Uh, at, at this point, um, I must end um, my, my remarks by congratulating Mariam Ram and her team at TNQ led by Avi and Kuri, uh, Avi for the awards and Kuri for uh, the <clears throat> for the lectures, for their tireless effort in trying to stir up the pot of science in India for so many years, and provide both inspiration and incentive for all of us to do the best science we can for the benefit of science and society. So, with that, um, I it's my privilege to invite uh, our awardees, um, and let me begin uh, by inviting Ahmed Iqbal Azmi. Uh, from Jamia Mila uh, Islamia, New Delhi, uh, as the first of the finalists. Hi, uh, Iqbal, would you tell us something about your paper? Yeah, am I audible, sir? 
Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, in my paper, so in that uh, in that paper, we have used the saliva as a diagnostic specimen and check the that whether this saliva contain the RNA, viral RNA or not. So for that, we collected this saliva uh, from the patient samples and those patient samples were tested previously in the hospital. So we collected the saliva sample, extracted the RNA and did the real-time PCR. And we found that this saliva can, can have a sufficient of RNA, viral RNA that can be used as a diagnostic specimen. So in the next step, we wanted to use saliva directly as a specimen without that is RNA extraction free. So for that, we have used different concentration of protein SK, different uh, concentration of mucolytic agents, and different uh, condition of temperature, heating temperature. So proteinase, can, proteinase K, we found that the proteinase concentration that is 1.25 mg per ml, tritone X100, that is 0.5%, and uh, N-acetyl cysteine, which is a mucolytic agent, which is 0.5%. It's sufficient to release the viral RNA from the saliva sample. So we have validated this formulation on the clinical saliva samples as, as well, and compared the results with the RT-QPCR those were extracted from the saliva samples. And we get that there is a close agreement with the kit-based RNA extraction method. So in the next, we wanted to make this diagnosis, diagnostic processes more simple. So we integrated this uh, technique, this workflow with the Sherlock method, which is a well-known method, which was developed in Peng Zhang Lab in 2017. So detection of, uh, uh, detection of infection by Sherlock method can be done either by using fluorescence readout or lateral flow assay. So we choose, in our study, we choose lateral flow assay. For that, we perform two pot reaction. First one is the RT-RPA reaction, which is the reverse transcriptase uh, recombinase polymerase, which is again an isothermal reaction and a Sherlock reaction. So, by combining these techniques, we were able to detect up to 200 copies of the technique uh, or two copies of the standard RNA, that is the viral uh, standard RNA. So further image analysis based quantification improve the uh, analytical sensitivity to 100 copies. Then to make the results user friendly, we integrated the lateral flow stick with a smartphone application so that we can use this smartphone for the storage of the data or online consultancy. So overall, we integrated, uh, we abbreviated this over whole integrated technology as a CASPIT, which is the CAS-13 assisted saliva based smartphone integrated testing. So in short, we have developed, we have established uh, RNA extraction free workflow that can be used directly for the detection of the infection, or it can also be used for the uh, uh, isothermal reaction or the uh, one step, uh, I can, we can say the point of care testing. Right. Uh, that, that, thank you, Iqbal. I mean, if I, if I may just ask whether these, uh, uh, the kit, the, the assay itself is in deployment somewhere or is it is it still uh, in um, in development with you or, or with some company uh, we are in the process we are in that process uh, in to collaborate with the company but it is in on the process I see. is in the still in the process i see and and will you be able to detect other variants as well of, of, of the different so we we uh, we, are, we are working on that so we are working on the detection on the delta variants or we are also working on how to improve the sensitivity of this uh, detection method. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll next uh, call Mayank Garg uh, from uh, IGIB um, in New Delhi. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, hello, everyone. I am Mayank. And I'm really honored to have been selected as a finalist for the Inspiring Science Award 2022. Now, 
I am basically a physician by training and to some extent I've been an intensivist too. So when I was working in the intensive care units, I realized that when we are dealing with diseases like pneumonia, we physicians are really in a limbo because we have to manage microbial clearance and we have to manage, uh, we have to limit the cellular death caused due to inflammation. And this shortage of options is what motivated me to move to basic research. I joined IGIB and I met uh, Dr. Anurag Agrawal and Dr. Krishnendu Chakrabarti. And these two eminent scientists introduced me to the world of DAMPs. Now DAMPs or damage associated molecular patterns are certain endogenous cellular components that can act as immunomodulators. And when we come to talk of uh, DAMPs from the mitochondria, things get really interesting because mitochondria still retain certain prokaryotic signatures uh, due to their ancestry. So what we started looking in was the role of the mitochondrial dam, specifically the mitochondrial inner membrane uh, component cardiolipin and how it could be playing a role in causing uh, diseases like pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. And what we found was that cardiolipin can suppress a very important anti-inflammatory cytokine that is IL-10, which leads to a persistent inflammatory state. This is in murine models. And what next was that we also identified a drug which is already in clinical use. We were able to use this drug to reverse the suppression of IL-10. That is what excites me the most because if we have a drug which can limit inflammation, and interestingly, this drug was not flaring up the bacterial infection. So it is giving, up a, the, giving us a therapeutic alternative to steroids, which is the most widely used drug for lung injuries, specifically pneumonias to limit inflammation. But steroids do flare up infections and they have a host of other side effects. So I really see a lot of clinical relevance in this study. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that, that's a very exciting work. And uh, I mean, the question I had was, you know, where, where do these cardiolipins get generated from? I mean, they are they due to intracellular damage or are they coming from, uh, you know, what, what parts of the, uh, right. is the mechanism here? Yeah, yeah. So, so like I said, these, these are endogenous components. Cardiolipin is a very important component of the uh, mitochondria. It is playing a role in different, it's, it's part part of the integrity of the inner mitochondrial membrane as well as it's involved in certain respiratory complexes. So when it is present in physiology in a normal homeostatic condition, it is playing an important physiological role. But when there is a cellular stress, specifically when there is necrosis, when there's unregulated cell death, like we see in acute diseases, what happens is these cellular components are not able to go through the regular pathways of say autophagy, mitophagy or apoptosis and sometimes they get released into the extracellular milieu. And then they can also undergo certain transformations like cardiolipin can undergo oxidization and that leads to them becoming from physiological molecules, they become pathological and uh, they start triggering the immune response. And that's where the cardiolipin is even more interesting because it's something that the mitochondria shares with the bacteria. So that's pretty much the position. Right, no, that's very interesting. And um, well, I, I think, you know, there's many more questions I have, but I think we should let you go and congratulations to you and to Iqbal as well. Uh, I've forgotten so to congratulate him, but uh, you know, great work. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Uh, I'd next like to invite um, Parej uh, Nath, uh, uh, at the Infectious Disease Biology Laboratory at ILS in Bhubaneswar. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Team Q for selecting me as one of the finalists for their Inspiring Science Awards 2022. I'm really glad that I've been given this chance today to come up and talk about my paper titled Inhibition of IRGM establishes a robust antiviral immune state to restrict various pathogenic viruses, where we are showing that uh, an antiviral immune state of the cell gets uh, remarkably enhanced when this immunity-related uh, GTPS, that is IRGM, gets depleted. So this uh, polymorphism in this gene IRGM has been linked with several uh, inflammatory disorders, autoimmune disorders, and various pathogenic infections. And in all of these cases, IRGM is shown to have a protective role. Now, this protective role of IRGM 
you know, by means of um, modulating inflammatory machineries by reducing inflammation has been previously demonstrated. And one of which was IRGM negatively regulating type 1 interferon response by uh, minimizing the activity of the two PRR signaling pathways, that is PGAS sync pathway and Rigai map pathway by means of utilizing a selective uh, autophagy. Now, in this study, we have discussed the flip side of this phenomenon, where we are showing that by depleting IRGM, it elevates type 1 interferon response in the cells, which is, of course, one of the major antiviral host responses. And this brings the cells in an antiviral state that restricts variety of viruses. We are showing that virus infection as well as viral PAM uh, treatment induces the expression of IRGM, but the viral PAM induced type 1 interferon response is getting negatively regulated by IRG. Besides, we're also showing that when IRGM is suppressed, several of the important viral restriction factors which restrict virus infection at various stages, they are upregulated. Also, some important antiviral mechanisms like MHC uh, antigen, MHC1 antigen presentation pathway, stress renewal pathway, these, are, these two are also activated when IRGM is absent in the cell. So under these conditions, uh, it can be said that the cells are going to an antiviral state where they are strongly restricting a plethora of viruses starting from uh, chikungunya, uh, Japanese encephalitis, uh, West Nile virus, Zika virus, um, then uh, herpes virus, and of course, uh, the virus which is under spotlight now, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, also in our um, animal model, that is in IRGM knockout mice, when we infected this mice with chikungunya virus, we found that these mice are showing excellent resilience against this virus. So we are saying that um, this property of IRGM can be exploited uh, for the development of uh, antiviral host-directed therapy, uh, which will be uh, like uh, promote the overall antiviral autoimmune state of the cell. And I feel that this study is important in a way because we are highlighting a host factor, in this case IRGM, as a target uh, for the development of antiviral prophylactic against um, you know, various emerging new strains of viruses over the period of time, uh, which we all agree that right now is the need of the art. Thank you, um, Parish, for that really excellent summary of your, of your work. Uh, if, if I may ask, if, if you were to take this IREGM, IRGM inhibition forward, I mean, would one would need to find a, a, some way of reducing the IREGM activity in an organism, right? In, say, in a host. So are there, uh, I mean, therapeutic windows that you could imagine for the reduction of IREGM in order for you to use such, a, such knowledge in a translation effort? Yeah, sir, uh, the GTPS domain of IREGM is absolutely necessary for its function. So if we can have small molecules or any drug that specifically targets that DTPS domain of IRGM, that will render the protein inactive. So in that case, it won't be functional and what we are aiming for uh, might be possible. So, so you think these are going to be very general antivirals that uh, of the uh, yes. generation? Yeah? Yes, so for in our case, we have seen that a, a variety of viruses like DNA and RNA viruses the innovation of IRGM is restricting like all of them. In general, it is upregulating the type 1 interferon response. So we feel that it will be a generalized response for almost all viruses from our study. Right. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Well, thank you very much. Um, you. And um, congratulations again for being a finalist. Thank you. Thank you. I'd next um, like to invite Suranjana Pal. Uh, who is right now um, very sitting very early in the morning in uh, St. Louis in the in at U, in USA to tell us something about her work. Uh, before you start, I I mean just um, could you just read out the title of the paper that you uh, have published, which has caught our attention. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, thank you, Professor May. Thrilled to be one of the finalists uh, for this year's award. Uh, so our study uh, 
is an early cortical uh, progenitor specific mechanism, uh, regulates thalamocortical innervation. So uh, in this particular study, we have identified the requirement of a key gene in the mammalian cerebral cortex that regulates uh, the development of the circuits that relay sensation or the sense of touch to our higher brain centers. Uh, when this particular gene is deleted or lost in the mother stem cells of the cortex, the resulting daughter neurons, they are not only showing deficits in their molecular properties, but they also are electrically and functionally silent. Uh, and this results in profoundly uh, aberrant uh, growth of these incoming sensory inputs and a severe disruption of the major sensory input pathway to the brain. So our work underscores the importance of uh, gene regulation in a neuronal progenitor cells in order for their post-mitotic uh, progeny to have normal molecular properties and circuit connectivity. And uh, our study also seems to suggest that uh, neuronal activity in the early developing brain uh, acts hand in hand with such genetic mechanisms for building refinement and maintenance of brain circuits. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Suranjana. Uh, I, I guess, so, I mean, what, what, what you're also suggesting is that, uh, I mean, early sensory experience is likely to, to mold what the adult might end up being able to, able to um, I guess, uh, experience, right? I mean, and, and some, of this, some of what you're describing are the circuits that are involved in that experience. Right. So, yes. uh, I mean, if I may translate what you have just said for the uh, lay person, uh, is that correct? Uh, to a large extent, I would just add, it's not just early sensory experience coming in from the environment or from the periphery. <clears throat> it's also spontaneous activity in the neurons per se, like while the uh, child or the fetus is still growing in its mother's womb, the spontaneous activity in the neuronal in the neurons while the child is growing uh, is also instructive uh, in determining how the circuits will build and this uh, acts in tandem with the genes that are uh, expressed while the child i mean while the embryo is growing uh, to uh, uh, like control how the circuits will be built and any perturbations during uh, windows uh, that are called critical periods may interfere with these processes and when uh, like in, at adult stages, it will have profound consequences on uh, how the brain processes information and so on and so forth and regular functioning of an organism. Right, I guess similar things happen even in the visual system, right? Yes, yes, right. absolutely, absolutely. Right, well, you know, uh, thank you so much for, for your uh, uh, you know, lucid explanation of your work uh, and thank congratulations you. again for uh, being a finalist. Thank you. So um, uh, the, the next uh, finalist is Deep Prakash, who is currently at the University of Edinburgh as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, but his work was conducted whilst he, whilst he was at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Um, Deep, uh, welcome. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you Thank you, reading, reading your title of your paper, because uh, would you? Yeah, so uh, it is. Uh, so we are talking about um, the interaction between a uh, host and a pathogen and basically the impact of volatile. So basically, we identified a volatile, which is one on the scene produced by the pathogen, and we are deciphering the impact of that in the flight and fight response of the host, which is uh, Sinor hepatitis elegans. So uh, overall, in this study, the aim of uh, this study was to find the impact of the pathogenic volatiles on the behavior of physiology and uh, behavior and physiology of the host. And uh, one of the most important uh, question that we were interested in addressing was to um, to investigate whether a bacterial volatile can act as a molecular pattern or not. For uh, this study, we used the model organism, which is Sinor hepatitis elegans, and its interaction with the pathogen, which is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, C. elegans, um, it is a simple organism, yet a very efficient 
model organism for such kind of study because uh, it it has a well developed chemosensory system and also it is a bacteriovore so it feeds on bacteria and it can efficiently engage in um, in uh, finding food and also uh, it efficiently avoids pathogen so that was a kind of advantage for us to pick this uh, model organism uh, in this study just to start with we initially um, analyzed the volatile profile, the volatiles produced by the pathogen using a gas chromatography technique. And um, from this analysis, we came across a, a volatile, which is one undesign, which was the only uh, aversive signal found to be present in the headspace of the pathogen. Further, um, we went ahead analyzing, dissecting the details about what is the relevance of this volatile. And, how it is perceived by the uh, C. elegans. And in this, we found uh, by using the genetic mutants of the worms, we found that it is specifically sensed by uh, one of the neuron, a single neuron, which is AWB neuron present in the head region of the worms. And uh, we, we further confirmed this phenotype by uh, using in vivo neuronal calcium imaging. And uh, as one of the major findings from this work, I would say, and the most exciting one is uh, by using the transcriptomics approach, we found that the exposure of one undesign, the volatile alone, induces a upregulation of a subset of immune response gene in the host. And this induction was um, very specific uh, related to the um, pathogen infection, that particular pathogen infection. And uh, additionally, also the pre-exposure of worms to this volatile, that is one undesign, alone was good enough to provide protection against any subsequent infection with the pathogen. And uh, overall, uh, this provides a very strong evidence that uh, the pathogen-associated volatiles can indeed act as a um, pathogen-associated molecular pattern. And uh, I mean, overall, um, such kind of studies what would be the relevance in future? I would say uh, the, the studies of uh, microbe-host interaction in terms of analyzing the volatiles from the pathogen and how does it um, affect the host would help us to understand more about uh, the impact of olfaction in the animal kingdom, how animals um, perceive the pathogen in the environment. And also in terms of um, clinical relevance, the study or identification of uh, signature volatiles from any uh, pathogens can help us to develop uh, non-invasive diagnostic tools, which will be uh, sort of volatile sensor-based tools. Thank you, Deep. Um, you know, that, uh, that, that actually brings to um, my mind a question about whether you can use volatiles as uh, sort of modulators of infection or, or you know modulators of infection even before you get the infection right I mean that that's what's happening yes. in, the, in the worm but yeah. you think this this could be this could work in other uh, organisms as well yeah in fact in fact that is one of the major highlight that I'm stressing on and also as a concept it sounds very like uh, I mean, it's not very easy to accept, but in our study, at least with this system, we found that if you just expose to the volatile, they are not in touch with the pathogen and still they show huge changes in the transcript level, at least transcript and also the behavior changes drastically. So the idea would be to take this concept further and just to um, sort of give more importance to the sense of smell and what could be the other changes in the physiology and behavior of even higher organisms and see how just smell can change uh, your behavior, your uh, physiology in, in terms of anything. So that, that is one of the concepts we are establishing. Right, so, so infection could bias, uh, I mean, volatiles from infectious agents uh, could bias your immune sense, uh, immune protection as well. I mean, I, I think people have argued yes. about this for a, for a long time. But do you think this work is showing yes. us? So it, it, it does provide. 
In fact, uh, in this study, we have shown that uh, the bacterial mutant that doesn't produce this, uh, uh, this volatile, which is one undesin, the worms tend to, uh, they're more susceptible in this mutant. So basically when they are infected with this mutant, which doesn't produce this volatile, in fact, they're not able to develop good immune system and therefore they are more susceptible to infection. So as a, as a, um, as a tool or as a, so the volatile can itself induce your immune response and make you ready to fight infection, even if you're uh, like, even before actual exposure of the pathogen. So as a concept, it might work. The only thing is we might have to try in higher organisms and take it to like, other advanced levels. Have you sniffed the material that you're giving the worm? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was, like you can imagine, it was three, four years of work. And at one point of time, I was sensitized, like desensitized, I would say, yeah. Okay. So uh, initially, it was terrible to smell, but eventually, yeah, I, I, I sort of liked it. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations yeah. um, again. Uh, thank you. Thank for you. That thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now I'd like to in, invite uh, Monalisha Rat, um, who is also from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, but she's currently in Orissa. Hello, Monalisha. Uh, if you could tell us something about your work, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, coming to my work. As opposed to animals, plants show indeterminate growth pattern where the trunk divides continuously and make a giant tree and continue to produce organs throughout their lifespan, which can go up to thousands of years, which is because of the stem cells that are present at the growing tip of the plant, which is called meristem or the stem cell nest. So as opposed to that, there are the organs like leaves, flowers, or fruits, they show the finite growth pattern where they doesn't grow further once they reach up to a finite shape or size. So that is that that happens because of the differentiation factors which antagonize the stemness and then may the, uh, give the signal for the organs to stop growing. So this counterbalance or the antagonistic activity between the stemness. So we studied leaf development. Uh, so is it audible? Yeah. Yes, yes, you're audible. Yeah. It's coming through, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, so based on this, uh, this balance between stemness and differentiation, leaves have been divided into two categories, simple and compound. Simple leaves are those whose lamina or leaf blade is intact. Uh, like we see in mango, oak, or uh, uh, spinach. So what happens in those leaves are the, the stemness genes are restricted or antagonized by the whereas a, and on the other hand in the compound leaves where the leaf lamina is di di dissected or divided into leaf layers. So in those kind of leaves like tomato or neem, what happens is the stemness genes are carried forward even in the growing leaves. They are not only developing leaf. So that is why the differentiation factors comes into picture little delay that makes the compound leaf. So scientists have studied and they have made the compound leaf more or less compound. But till now, there are no evidence where the intactness of the simple leaf is disturbed. So that brings the major question in plant biology that what are the determining factors that restrict the simple leaf structure to be simple and what gives the signal that when the leaf should stop growing. So our study uh, has solved this question by identifying two major group of transcription factors, namely SYNTCPs and NOX2, which work in collaboration to restrict the stemness genes into the meristem. So uh, using Arabidopsis as the plant model, when we have downregulated both these families of transcription factors, SYNTCPs and NOX2 together, so what we found is the simple leaf of Arabidopsis has converted into a super compound form where the leaf lamina continues to divide and dissect and form new leaflets uh, throughout its life. So uh, if we see uh, a normal wild type Arabidopsis leaf, which stop 
uh, growing after 30 days uh, after 30 days and starts a nesting as opposed to that this particular mutant super compound leaf continue to grow even till 6 months making the leaf a like forever young plant uh, or the forever young leaf uh, with a juvenile identity of genes so this happened mostly uh, uh, from the uh, transcriptomic analysis. What we have found is this happened because of the extended activity of this meristematic genes present in the developing leaf. And uh, this uh, uh, delayed the maturation schedule of the leaf. And uh, interestingly, when in this background, we have provided one of the member of this transcription factors, differentiation factors, we could completely rescue the phenotype irreversibly into a simple form. So we have uncovered the molecular mechanism, how the simple or the determinate leaf development happens and what are the molecules involved in it. Uh, um, thank you for that, uh, Malisha. Uh, I, I had a uh, question about uh, the, the evolutionary sort of, uh, you know, um, the evolutionary sort of ordering of these of this system. I mean, it almost seems like from your work that the compound leaf is perhaps the sort of the more, the, more of the ancestral, uh, yes. uh, you know, setup, and then and then the simple leaf shows up. Uh, uh, yes, that, uh, actually our work gives that kind of evidence that the compound leaves are the ancestral origin, and due to the evolution of these transcription factors they give the signal to make the simple leaves and it also supports another evidence that uh, there is an evolutionary concept known as telome theory which tells that stem evolution which is an indeterminate pattern because stem branches indeterminately it doesn't stop it bifurcates and grows throughout its lifespan but leaves are the determinate structure but that was only a concept evolutionary concept but our work supports or gives the uh, practical evidence to that uh, theory as well that indeed the indeterminate growth pattern is the ancestral origin and the determinate pattern is the later on came into picture right well, that's that's extremely fascinating i mean and it just tells us how little we know about uh, you know the way plants are put together and you know and covering something so fundamental as this is really very exciting thank you so much and congratulations for this nice piece of work Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank sure. you, sir. Thank you. Um, and I'd next uh, like to invite uh, Rinku uh, Sahu, um, who um, is from the Institute of Life Science in Bhubaneswar again, uh, to talk about his work. Um, please go ahead, Rinku. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. So good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the jury members First of all, I'd like to thank all the jury members for recognizing our work, which is entitled as uh, RBRL, RNA binding ring ethyl ligase DG3 protein, which stabilizes cyclin D1 to drive uh, cell cycle and cancer progression. Now, RNA binding ring ethyl ligases are a very unique group of RNA binding proteins, which regulate both RNA and protein metabolism. DG3 is one of the RBRL, which was first identified to be interacting with uh, hepatitis B virus mRNA and lateral studies has showed that it is it also interacts with uh, uh, arginine uh, arginine methyl transferase COM1 protein uh, which co-activates the transcripts uh, which co-activates the transcription of uh, uh, estrogen receptor alpha regulated genes now uh, recent advances uh, in cancer research has shown that uh, majority of these RNA binding proteins being dysregulated uh, in several of the cancer types. And what in this study we found that upon depletion of DZIP3, there, uh, there is massive defect in cell growth, cell migration, as well as cell invasion properties. And this defect was uh, due to the cell cycle arrest at the G1 phase and not due to any cell death. So, uh, as since we know that uh, uh, cyclin uh, D1 protein, which is very much essential for the transition of this cell cycle from G1 to S phase, so we hypothesize that uh, uh, DG3 might be regulating uh, cyclin D1. 
And indeed, we proved uh, that uh, DZIP3 regulates the cyclin D1 protein uh, at both at mRNA as well as protein level to drive the cell cycle and cancer progression. We also uh, observed that uh, uh, the DZIP3 being uh, very much amplified in several of the cancer types, including lung cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, etc. Now, this study for the first time uh, uh, demonstrates that uh, a unique two-prong mechanism of DZIP3, which regulates cyclin D1 protein, both at protein as well as mRNA level, that too in a phase-specific manner. So hence, uh, therefore, we, uh, we could strongly uh, say that DZIP3 can serve as a potential drug candidate for the cancer prevention. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you, uh, Rinku. Yeah. And I mean, uh, in, in terms of looking at the cyclins, the cyclins have been long a target for uh, drugs against cancer. I mean, they, I mean, ever since they've been discovered. Um, but it's been very hard to find uh, find you know drugs that will that will block cyclins and also ameliorate cancer because they're they're so ubiquitously involved in the in you know normal growth no. and normal growth and survival in in an animal. So so what do you think in this context? Do you think the Zip three is is a special player? Will we will there be better? prospects to develop new drugs? Uh, what, what is your view? Uh, indeed, it can be applied because, again, uh, the pharmacokinetics and dynamics will play uh, will come into play over here. And and somehow it is it is indeed related to the cyclines only. So, yeah. So, I mean, I understand that normal cells will, will, will be also hampered, but those things can be taken care of with the their kinetics and dynamics properties. And are you are you doing any of this work now, or what are uh, you doing now? Uh, currently, we are we are focusing on other aspects of this particular protein. I see. You you're continuing your work on this protein. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Well, thank you so much for that, and congratulations again for yes, being thank one you. of the finalists. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have uh, Swati Sharma, uh, who is currently in the University of Manchester. Uh, she uh, is going to talk about, she was at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Pune. Um, and she's going to tell us something about her work on, uh, on um, well, I'll wait for her to tell us what she's up to. Yeah, I would like to thank committee for selecting me for this award. And the title of our paper is Special Temporal Recruitment of Rho GTPase Protein Graph Inhibit Actomycin Ring Constriction in Drosophila Cellarization. So one fascinating question in developmental biology is the capacity of the cell to give rise to fully functional organism. And we focus on the final step of cell division, that is cytokinesis, where cleavage furrow forms and that undergoes contraction to divide the cell into two daughter cells. So the key question we focus on is how the timing and pace of cleavage furrow formation and contraction are regulated in the cell. So we use Drosophila embryogenesis cleavage furrow architecture that is divided into polygon, ring, and constricted shape across cellarization stage. So we found graph GTP is regulator associated focal adhesion kinase molecule initially enrich at the cleavage furrow and later become cytoplasmic during constricted stage. So the absence of this protein shows untimely, premature and hyperconstricted ring. And uh, I would emphasize that the, for the decades, the majority of the studies have focused on the activator, which activator uh, Road dependent pathway important for activating constricted ring. But we were the first one to uh, dissect this protein, which function along with this activator to fine tune the levels of row GTP that are required to inhibit the ring constriction. Thus, the novelty of our study is the presence of the graph act as an inhibitor and ensure the timing and pace of the constriction of the cleavage furrow that is very crucial for switching off the pathway. Thank you. Thank you for that, Swati. Uh, 
in, in some sense, what you're describing looks like a control, yeah. cir like a control circuit, right? I mean, where you have both feed forward and feedback inhibition to finely tune the operation of a of a machinery that is going to yeah. perform, say, a task such as cons uh, apical constriction. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering, I mean, do you think such a, me a mechanism uh, will operate in other aspects of the uh, cellularization that you, you are looking at? Uh, you know, for example, the generation of the, of the furrow itself, uh, or I mean, whether these sort of control mechanisms function in, in the same, in similar kinds of ways in these pathways? Yes, so definitely we uh, know the activator where the generation of the furrows are there, but somewhere it's very harder to find the inhibitors because there are a lot of redundants in the system. So uh, uh, it is really equally important because uh, inhibitors molecules are actually act as a more efficient regulators and you know important in uh, having a regulated developmental steps. Okay, this step is over now. Proceed to the next step. So they are a uh, very fine tuner, uh, yes. But so you think these are involved in fine tuning the circuits yeah. and providing yes, yes. the right kind of timing mechanisms for them to operate? Yes. yes. Right. Well, I think that that's um, really, you know, very nicely explained. And, uh, and, and I mean, you're, you're, you're the, you're, um, <clears throat> the last but not the least. Uh, and with that, I, I actually want to, you know, thank um, all these, all the finalists who provided really succinct uh, uh, descriptions of their work. Also, uh, all the people who, all the students who participated in this uh, uh, um, ISA uh, platform to expose their work to critique and uh, and also the finalists for coming up with with their you know um, success. Uh, and with that, I want to invite Mariam to announce the um, the winner of this ISA uh, awards. So, Mariam, uh, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Satyajit. But I'm not announcing the winner. <laughs> So, but it is my privilege to introduce our chief guest, Professor L.S. Shashidara. Professor Shashidara is an Indian geneticist and a molecular and evolutionary biologist. He is a distinguished professor of biology and dean of research at Ashoka University as, and is on lean from the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ISAP Pune. He is the first Indian to be elected as the president of the International Union of Biological Sciences in Paris. Professor Shashidara did his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at the University of Agricultural Sciences, Dharwar, from where he obtained a master's degree in genetics and plant breeding. He was awarded his PhD and did his postdoctoral studies at the University of Cambridge, <coughs> UK. Professor Shashidara returned to India to join NCBS as a visiting fellow. He then moved to CCMB in Hyderabad as a scientist and a group leader. Following that, he moved to ISA Pune as a professor and on to become the chair of biology. Here he pursued his studies on fruit fly genetics and embryology, working on the fruit fly, on the evolution of appendages and functions of homeotic selector genes. His research has focused on the development of limbs and the role played by ultrabithorax, a Hox gene functioning as a transcription factor. Studying the fruit fly as a model, he elucidated a number of key molecular pathways that affect the growth control and developed a fly model for studying adenomatous polyposis coli, a colon cancer gene in humans. His studies have also assisted in a wider understanding of the relationship between genes and diseases in humans and the development of tractable drug discovery model systems to ameliorate, ameliorate cancer. Passionate about improving science, education and research, Professor Shashidara convened a group 
of INSA, which drafted a vision document for Indian science. He is actively involved in policy debate and the drawing up of policy briefs in this area. Professor, Professor Shashidara also steers an international project on climate change education on behalf of the International Union of Biological Sciences. He serves as a member of the steering committee of India Bioscience, which he established along with Professor Mayer, Professor Ron Vale, and Professor K. Vijayaraghavan. Professor Shashidara is an elected fellow of all the three National Science Academies of India and of EMBO, the European Molecular Biology Organization. For his contribution to basic and applied biology, Professor Shashidara has received the CSIR Technology and the Shanti Swarupatnagar Prizes and the J.C. Bose National Research Fellowship. It is an honor to have this distinguished, public-spirited scientist and educator as our chief guest today. Thank you, Professor. May I now invite you to announce the winner and confer the TNQ Inspiring Science Award for 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. So I'm a bit embarrassing that uh, the longest session is introduction of, of me uh, in the midst of such fantastic work that uh, our students have done here. So, uh, you know, the, the juries have already decided who is going to be the, uh, the awardee of uh, 2022 Inspiring Science Award of TNQ. Uh, before I mention uh, the name, I would like to uh, mention that I really enjoyed you know, listening to all the eight finalists, amazing work. Of course, it represents the biological diversity, uh, you know, the kind of question that you're asking it from all the way from bacteria to human. More importantly, each one of you was sort of trying to sort of position your work in a larger context of, of the field that you are representing. Uh, you know, it could be something related to bacterial genetics or uh, human physiology. So uh, quite happy, and it's it's a it's a you know a happy situation for Indian science that such bright uh, students are working and have contributed to the growth of science, uh, global science, uh, from working from India. I'm sure you will all do well um, uh, in the coming years. Okay, now the <laughs> the task of announcing the winner. Um, I don't want to sort of make it very dramatic. Um, so it is uh, Swati Sharma from ISAPNI. Swati, congratulations on behalf of all of us. Much. Thank you. Yeah, Swati, you want to say something about after receiving the award? I know you already interacted with G2 and explaining something about your work and you know how are you feeling and and what did this award mean to you and how it will inspire you and others later. I think I'm deeply honored to receive this award from you as uh, Shashi sir was the one who initiated open lab system at ISER and gave an opportunity to have immense scientific discussions and expanding our uh, research with peers across different labs. And I would like to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Richa, who constantly tried to create an environment where I was able to manifest my best scientific potential. And uh, definitely my family, friends, lab people, and meditation group, who were my backbone throughout this journey. So uh, when I got this award news, I was remembering a moment from my life that where this interest began. And I realized that as a curious school kid, 
I got the chance to meet Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And uh, he not only inspired me, but was the first one who ignited my mind to explore scientific world. So I would like to dedicate this award as a tribute to him. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank audience and everybody. And thank God I like, yeah, this is something unexpected for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's it's a, it's a you know pleasant surprise for me, particularly because you're a student whom I knew, and uh, juries have definitely done a great job. And you know, I it was sort of when the, the name came to me, I think that you know, you know, oh wow, it's Swati. Anyway, so just you know, you already discussed your paper with G two, you know, the, the the constriction, and you are looking for the negative regulator of the constriction, right now. Whenever we explain a biological phenomena to a young kid or even to student, let's say you want to teach undergraduate students, we, we generalization is we talk about this causes this, this induces this, this triggers this, right? We don't get into the details of the mechanism. Now, as a researcher, of course, you have looked at the mechanism. You also looked at the feedback negative regulation. What, what, how do you explain the importance of your work to an undergraduate or even a school kid? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I would firstly tell that kid, you know, all of us know how to switch on the light. But if we keep on switching on the light, there's a lot of energy will get wasted. We don't want that energy to get wasted. We want to channelize it in a much more productive way. So switching on is important, but switching it off at the right timing is also equally important. And that's how the entire biology system, uh, you know, had a very intelligent mind that it not only know where to switch on, but it also know where and at what timing it needs to be switched it off. And that's where this very fundamental process come that, okay, cell division happened where rings have formed with constricted and two daughter cells have tried to go away now. So then whatever the machinery which is being created, that machinery need to be resolved and uh, so that it can either go to the next step or it can go to the previous steps. So in that way, I would like to uh, explain the students like how everything is so much interconnected in biology in switching on the pathway and how switching off the pathway is also there. Yes. So in, in, in just two sentences, what's your current work as a postdoc and what's your long-term research Plan. Would you like to come back to India and do something here? And what is that kind of a research plan you have? Academics. So, uh, yeah, so right now I am uh, working on uh, eye morphogenesis mm. and I am focusing on the uh, two disorders, globoma and microphthalmia, where during developmental defects, uh, if there is some issue happen, then there is a problem in vision and overall eye structure. So this, I will definitely bring it back to India because we are dealing with a lot many vision issues and all of us know like there's so many population which is having uh, eyesight issues. So this will definitely help in the long term as a community. So which system are you using? Which model system are you using? So right now we are trying organoids, mouse embryo and zebrafish. So I'm just trying to explore and then later on going to finalize yeah good all the best and congratulations again thank you thanks a lot so over to you maria you're on mute maria congratulations swati that's wonderful and congratulations to all italy thank you i'm over to abhi All right, um, as we close off the Inspiring Science Award Ceremony of 2022, uh, may I first thank Professor L.S. Sashitara for agreeing to be our chief guest and announcing this year's winner. His interaction with Swati Sharma was particularly insightful as this is his own uh, uh, research area. Um, may I also thank Professor Sachidit Mehr for presiding over the event and for being such a good friend of TNQ. Thank you to all of our 40 judges, panel chairs, and jury members who took time out of their academic and research commitments to evaluate 640 papers that were submitted this year. 
Applications for ISA 2023 will open in October this year. And I expect we will have an even greater participation from the Indian research community. Uh, special mention to everyone at TNQ who worked hard to make ISA 2022 possible. Viditi, Meghna, Kirtana, Murli, Praveen, Shankar, Swapnil, Shri Ganesh, Kuri, and Shanti, thank you. On account of uh, COVID-19 related travel restrictions, this award function could not be part of the TNQ Distinguished Lecture Series in the Life Sciences and has had to be online now for two years in 2021 and 2022. However, I am pleased to announce that in January 2023, we will host the 11th edition of the TNQ Distinguished Lecture Series. We are very excited about this and you will receive more details about this 11th set of lectures in the coming months. We will also return to our practice of announcing the finalists and the winners of the future edition of the Inspiring Science Awards, along with the annual TNQ Distinguished Lecture Series from January 2023. Today's event has been attended by members of the research and academic community, many from the institutes that our finalists represented, family and friends of our finalists, interested members of the public, and my colleagues from TNQ. Thank you, everyone, for joining this ceremony to felicitate and honor our 2022 IFA finalists and the winner, Swati Sharma. Congratulations once again to all of you. I wish you great success in your research and academic careers. All the very best. Thank you once again uh, to everyone for joining. Have a good evening and stay well.